So I was introducing the Huawei Certified Associate Cloud Computing version 4.0 professional training program. And uh, I'm going to be your instructor for today. Uh, what, like I told you before, my name is uh, Sandy Samuel, uh, and I'm going to be your instructor for this course. Now we wanted to look at the brief introduction to cloud computing and try to understand what is cloud computing. Why is it even important? Why are we even drawing our attention to cloud computing? And why are we even taking off time to understand what cloud computing is? So um, many of you are aware cloud computing uh, may be a technical term whose meaning is unclear to many, right? And, uh, but there's a good chance that many of us are already using cloud services, even without being aware that we have actually used the cloud service. And we are going to understand how and why. People or many people may have many questions when, uh, when, they, when they come across such terms like cloud computing, they may ask themselves, what is cloud computing? What kind of service does cloud computing provide and where and how can I acquire these services? So we want to be understanding what cloud computing is in the next coming slides. So IT uh, is, a fast grow, is a fast changing industry that we shall all agree and it is growing very rapidly. And cloud computing has been developing rapidly in the recent years and has become the foundation of a wide range of major applications. So what is cloud computing? How has it evolved uh, to what it is today? And this chapter will offer a brief introduction to the history and the present of cloud computing. So upon completion of this course, you uh, you'll be able to describe what cloud computing is You'll be able to describe the history of cloud computing, list a few use cases of cloud computing, and also describe the characteristics of cloud computing. Cloud computing is already here. Do you agree or you don't agree? <laughs> but cloud computing is already here. And many of us, either knowingly or unknowingly, we have used some of the services. Let us look at this example here. We can see they are several, um, there are several categories, including compute resources, storage resources, network resources, database, security application, enterprise intelligence. These are some of the, you know, resources or services that are being offered by the Huawei cloud, okay? We can see all these resources. And each category also further contains a variable number of services. Like you can see, we have selected cloud compute here and under compute, we can have a cloud um, elastic server. We have a bare metal server. We have auto scaling. We have image management service and so many other services. Even under storage, even under network, even under database, there's so many other services that are under there. Now, if you look at cloud, uh, if you look at um, compute virtualization and we are looking at now the elastic cloud server, um, it is a popular service on the Huawei cloud and the Elastic Cloud Server or what we are calling the ECS is a flavor which is similar to the computer hardware. It's, it's a server in the cloud, but it's similar to, you, to our you know, hardware servers that we have today, right? It has compute resources uh, containing uh, CPU, memory, hard disk, and even other parameters that any other normal computer can have. And to ready uh, an Elastic Cloud Server, we we will also need to install the required operating system. So when you go ahead on, on, uh, on uh, you know, Huawei Cloud and we go ahead and we buy the Elastic Cloud server and we pay for it, subscribe for it, we shall need to install an operating system. We shall need to install the, you know, runtime environment. We shall need to install our applications, uh, give it an IP address and, you know, configure it like how you'd configure any other normal computer because it's just a server and it's being offered at infrastructure as a service. And we're going to look at these things later on in detail. So it can do almost anything a conventional computer can do uh, or what the conventional computer does, such as maybe editing documents, sending emails, enabling office collaborations, plus things that a conventional computer cannot do. For example, we can access our Elastic server even on a mobile phone or even a tablet or even 
and get and still get similar user experience even from a mobile tablet or even a phone or even from any other terminal which has maybe a web browser and internet and then we can be able you know to send in input and output commands and we are able to operate the computer while getting a similar user experience as when it is accessed through a computer with a big screen so you can also modify the configurations of our you know elastic server just like any other computer and uh, at any time and here it is easy for us either to scale in or scale out like let's say add more you know memory and maybe move from 2 gb to 4 gb just there and then with a few clicks and then you already have all your services provided. So in, in summary, everything that I've been talked about here, it's, it enables us, or cloud computing allows us to use IT services as conveniently as using utilities like water and electricity. Think about how we use water and electricity. Just a moment, just a moment. All right, uh, sorry about that. I was putting away my phone as over getting phone calls. I apologize for that. So we are saying in summary, cloud computing allows us to use IT services as conveniently as using utilities, like either, uh, you know, water, or for those who are in Uganda, like umeme, right? You just pay for what you want to use, how much you want to use. If you want five units, six units, you just go and pay for that utility and then you use that utility. When you come to think about it, the way we use water and these other utilities like either water or electricity, we use water and electricity simply by turning on our tap or power, right? If you want to have your lights on, you just go ahead and switch on, put on the switch, and then boom, your lights will go on. If you want to get a cup of water, a can of water, you go to your tap and then you just open it and then you get water, right? And then it will start flowing. All you need to do is just to go on and power on the switch. This is because already in the grid system, already in your lines, in your power lines, right? The, uh, the electricity and water, they are already on the grids. And this is also true when it comes to IT services. Cloud computing delivers ready to use IT services over the internet. And just think of this analogy, like the internet being the grid, you know, the power grid, the internet being the grid and all those services are already there and readily available, yeah? And you can either access them over, over you know, web portals, all apps, and, and these now can act as a tap, right? For you to go to the web browser, that is like the tap for you to access what these services which are on the grid, right? And that is our internet. So you may be using cloud computing already, and you are not aware, right? You may say, I have my personal computer and most of the applications I need are installed already. I even don't connect to the internet. Oh, my VLC, I play my movies, my local disk, and I don't even use, you know, services like facial recognition or voice recognition or even, you know, backing up my, my Office 365 document somewhere in the cloud. So IT services are, are, not, are not necessarily water or electricity. So I can live without them. Cloud computing has nothing to do with me. There's a chance that you actually might be wrong. And some of you are already using cloud, uh, cloud computing services. Like you can see in this picture, there is a backup and restore. Many of you who have smartphones today, most of you either store your contacts on iCloud or on uh, Google contacts. Is that correct? Yes. And your right. whether you switch devices, your contacts already just, you know, tap and get your previous contacts and synchronize them 
as and when you need them. You either back up, even some go ahead and back up their pictures and everything on iCloud. Ladies and gentlemen, you're already yeah. using cloud computing services, okay? And also, some of you who maybe want to, you know, translate and inquisitive, you know, you know, want to learn more about other languages, you have used Google Translate, or you have used some other services that are being offered by Google Cloud platform, platform services, and you have already used cloud services already. Also, there's an iReader, a reader, let's say like Amazon, where you get to, you know, read books online and all those are services that are being offered by cloud computing. So today, many of us have actually got an opportunity to use cloud computing services, whether intentionally or unintentionally. So let us look at the cloud computing advantages and try to understand some of the characteristics of cloud computing. And cloud computing has five well-recognized characteristics and we want to look at them now. Now let us look at on-demand self-service. A supermarket is a good example. Uh, here we have our cart and you have gone to the supermarket, you have collected things, wallets, car, whatever you want to buy and you put inside your cart and then you roll your trolley and then you go to the counter to make payment. So a supermarket is a good example of on-demand self-service. In a supermarket, each consumer chooses the items they need by themselves, right? You will go and choose whether they want to buy this, even remove it, put it back. And on-demand self-service is also one of the major characteristics of cloud computing. A consumer can you know, choose the computing capabilities such as server time, storage, network storage, as needed automatically without even needing to require human interaction with any of the service provider. If I wanted to get an ESC or Amazon uh, Elastic Cloud Server, I'll just go onto their portal, log in, uh, choose what I want, choose the kind of memory I want, choose the CPU, the type of storage, and then go ahead and provision my server. I have not talked to any person from Amazon. I have not called them and told them, you know, help me prepare this and put it ready. So I can go ahead and, you know, like self-service, like as you go for and, and on a line of buffet and, you know, get what you want and put on your plate all that you want to eat. So also cloud computing has that characteristic or even advantage that I don't need to have any human interaction with a service provider for me to quickly choose the services I need. But for the prerequisite of on-demand self-service, you need to be aware of your needs. So the prerequisite is for the consumer to understand their own needs and know which product or products can accommodate such needs, right? Because you want to buy something. If you don't know what you want to buy, how are you even going to buy it or even select it anyway? So the prerequisite for on-demand service is for you to understand that I need, oh, I need, uh, I need a server with let's say two GB RAM memory, and also maybe let's say two, five, six GB of, 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 hard, of storage. So you need to understand your needs. And that is a prerequisite for on-demand uh, uh, self-service. So let us also try and look at broad network access. With broad network access here, sorry, with broad network access, what basically, uh, With broad network access, just a moment. You see the internet is common today and almost every corner in the world to some extent has some kind of connectivity. And cloud computing is computing power of the, over the internet, isn't it? You will need the internet for you to be able to use cloud computing services. So that's why the network access or network access is an intent or is a prerequisite characteristic of cloud computing. You need network access for you to be able to use cloud computing. It is a requirement. It is necessary for cloud computing. Good thing is that today the internet has reached almost every corner of the world and we use any electronic device. We can even use our personal computers, tablets, or even cell phones to connect to the internet. Uh, let us look at resource pooling. Like you hear the word resource pooling, you have you know resources, different resources, and you're pulling them together to offer something 
better. So resource pooling is one of the prerequisite of on-demand self-service because how is a customer going to enter a supermarket and pick from things when there are no things available, when there are no resources available? So you need to first put resources available, like you put there, you know, so many items in one rack, another items in one rack, so that when someone comes who is going to choose from these items, already the resources are, you know, pulled together and they are put in, you know, in one pool where the user can select from. So resource pooling is one of the prerequisites of on-demand self-service. And in a, like an example of a supermarket, we can see that different categories of items are put into different areas, such as vegetable, uh, you know, uh, electronics, frozen foods, etc. So that a user can quickly find such items. They can go, you know, in that area where they're selling frozen foods, and they can easily choose their fruits, and they go ahead and, uh, you know, uh, quickly choose what they want. Resource pooling is not just merely putting all those resources of the same type onto the same rack. It is also, uh, it is also about breaking down these resources to make them flexible, uh, so that it is easy for a customer to do on-demand self-service. Uh, an example is like you see in this diagram. You can have different types of juice. Let's say you have here, you have mango. Here you have let's say cola, and here maybe you have. Uh, you have apple juice, right? You have apple juice. So you as an individual, depending, you can either use to use a splash. For us who are in Uganda, you can use Ona, or you can use any other, you know, other series or any other service provider. And someone will not know. For example, if we have put inside here, we have put there, let's say we have used splash, and a user will come. And it is shielding this user from the underlying differences. For them, all they will know, all they will take is that I've taken apple juice. Here, if it is cola, we may choose to just say maybe, let us use Pepsi, and we're going to put in Pepsi Cola, right? At the end of the day, we shall just label our tank cola, and a user will come and choose. And it has shielded. We don't need to know whether it is from Pepsi Cola, or whether it's from Coca Cola, or whether it's from Reham Cola, or whether it's from whatever that there would be. So this is resource pooling. It's characteristic also, it shields the underlying differences, right? Um, uh, resource pooling helps us to shield the differences in the underlying resources. You have your underlying resources. You don't need to know whether the CPU is for AMD or for Intel or for whatever you know, uh, company. All you need to know, I need a CPU that is going to run I need maybe two virtual CPUs, uh, CPUs that are going to run maybe at 3.0 gigahertz, gigabits per second, right? Gigahertz for, per second. So for you, that's all you need to care. That's all you need to concern yourself with. So resources that can be pulled into, uh, that can be pulled include compute resources, include storage resources, include network resources. Compute resources include resources like CPU and memory, right? Um, uh, whereas pulled CPU resources are available to consumer per core, right? You can choose to have one cores, two cores, etc. And you can get even these cores from different CPUs. So consumers have no idea whether they are using AMD or Intel CPUs. Okay, we shall discuss uh, about uh, resource pooling uh, when we come to compute virtualization. I think that will be the next chapter. So let us look at rapid elasticity. With the uh, rapid elasticity, this application that may uh, require, you know, fluctuations in demand. Let's say you have your application. Let's say you're the owner of Jumia and for some reason, uh, during the mid media, you don't have so many sales, right? You have a few customers buying, but towards the end of the year, during the festive season, so many people are buying from your platform and you need to actively <laughs> keep scaling in your system or scaling up. Cloud computing gives us that option. We have the ability to rapidly and elastically provision compute resources in a desirable future. 
when the load increases during peak hours, like let's say in, in Christmas days or even days for you know holidays and people are buying, or in the major case, maybe there's a, is a social or commercial event, we can easily and quickly provision more servers, right? And automatically, it can even be automatic in some cases, right? So when the load reduces, the servers can also be you know, quickly released and you get back to your normal mode. And we shall look at it in details how that is done. So rapid elasticity here basically uh, helps us to do both scaling in or out and can be achieved manually based on the predefined policies. You will configure as a cloud computing engineer. You configure that when my resources maybe let's say hit 70%, kindly, just uh, you know, run this policy and increase, and maybe add 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 there more resources or this amount of resources, and we shall be looking at that in the nearby future. So scaling can be done by increasing the quantity of servers, or even by increasing or decreasing the resources available in each server. You can say let just increase memory, or let us just add one server. And uh, an example here is like this monkey here. Uh, it's a very popular game in China. It's called the Wukong. Uh, some people call it the Jingu Bang. And this monkey here, when it's battling or fighting, uh, you know, the monsters, it has a magic road. Eh? And this magic road will expand depending on how big the monster is. So if it, if it has a bigger task at hand, the magic wand will automatically or rapidly uh, be elastic and it will match if the monster is bigger and to match the monster at hand. If the monster grows bigger, then also the magic wand will also uh, uh, be elastic and it also grow in size to match the monster uh, at hand. So if it also decreases, also that goes ahead and decreases in size. Uh, so let us also look uh, uh, at, at, at measured service, but maybe before we look at measured service, I want you to pay attention that the most benef significant benefit of rapid elasticity is uh, cost reduction with guaranteed business continuity and reliability, right? Because you are guaranteed that your customers are not going to access your site and you're selling them error, uh, you know, server 50, 502, 504, your server cannot be accessed because you know there have been too many requests. When the requests are many, automatically you can you know your 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 services can be increased uh, or reduced depending on the need. So you have guaranteed business continuity and reliability. So uh, if if you are maybe setting up a startup company, you can choose like you know what. For now, I don't have so many customers. Let me just start with just enough that is going to take care of my problems. And then as your business grows and you get more customers, your uh, compute resources can easily be, uh, you know, scaled in or scaled out accordingly. Let us look at measured service. Uh, the measured service is how cloud systems control a user or team Excuse me, sir. resources. Uh, the, could you please pardon on the advantages of rapid elasticity? You say because are saying a uh, rapid elasticity, it helps us as far as cost, you know, uh, 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 it helps us in costs, uh, reducing costs. And also it helps us to make sure there's continuity, business continuity, and also that our systems are reliable. How cost re reduction comes into play is that because remember, instead of going ahead and you buy a very big server that you're even not going to use, right? Here, you just get only that you're going to and pay for only what you're going to use, right? What your systems are going to use. You're not going to pay for extra resources, which are not going to use. So you're just going to pay only for what you're going to use. And in case you need more resources, you can easily expand or increase on your compute resources as opposed to think of it in the traditional way and you have your server, you bought your server and you want to increase, you have already used up your, your RAM slots. All you need to do, you just have to go and buy another server, install it, configure it, buy a license for an operating system if you're not using an open source operating system, pay for it as well, you know, update it and do all that. All those 
you are actually incurring more operation and maintenance costs. So that's why we are saying rapid elasticity as a cloud computing characteristic helps us in uh, 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 reducing costs. Let us look at, we are looking at measured service. And when you are looking at measured service, uh, it is how cloud systems control a user or tenants use eh, of resources by leveraging a metering capability. Here, they just want to know how much are we using, right? And for how long are we using these resources? So they just want to control our use, you know, to, to control and see the usage of the cloud services that we're accessing. This is what they're calling a measured service. They're able to know that we have given this user two virtual CPUs, uh, let's say with uh, four cores, and we have given this user six you know, gigabit of memory, and they're going to have an SSD drive of about, let's say 128 GB. This is it. And this user has subscribed to this service for 12 months, okay? And we, for 12 months. So this is the metering capability. And this is where people go wrong. Metering is not bidding. Metering is just measuring how much the user is using and for how long is using. So metering necessarily is not bidding. Although now when they're going to bill you, just like when you have your water or electricity at home, you will be using it every day and they will be metering you, right? Every day that passes by and you use water, if you are in Uganda and you're using National Water and Sewage Corporation and you're using their water, the units will be moving and every day counts. They are metering you, right? So at the end of the month, they will come to you and bill you. But remember, metering is not necessarily billing because you have been using every day and not every day you are being billed. You are billed at once when the biller comes and looks at your metering, see that you have used, let's say, 20 liters and you have been using those 20 liters for, let's say, 20 days. Then they, based on these details that were measured, to bill you. So that's why we are saying that metering is not billing, but although when they're going to bill you, they base on these metering details. And now they'll base on this and they say, for such a user who has used uh, these kind of, you know, metering capabilities, uh, we should bill them $2 per month, or we shall bill them this amount of money. Because they have been using for these services for this amount of time, we are billing you $6, okay? So this is, a measured service. We are saying it's not necessarily, metering is not billing, although billing is based on metering. So in cloud computing, most of our services come with a price, yeah? When you go and, you know, get to Amazon site and, and do what, some of them come with a site. While some others are free, there are some services, you can even have a free tier and actually provision your server online for free. Uh, there's some services like auto scaling usually are provisioned as a service and they come at free, no charge, right? So not every service that is metered is actually built. So you can have, uh, you can use some services, they meter you, they know that you are using auto scaling and you're going to be using it for 12 months and you're going to be using, let's have free tier of one virtual CPU and you're not going to exceed one GB of memory, and you use these, you know, metered details for free, minus necessarily bidding. And that's why this point is validated that metering is not necessarily bidding. Though, uh, when they come to bill you next time, they will base on these metrics for them to bill you. I hope that point has been, uh, you know, taken home. Measured service ensures that all resources can be accurately measured through technical or even other means based on maybe predefined criteria, which can be the duration of you know, usage, resource quota, or even the volume of data transmitted with these cloud systems that can automatically control and adjust our resource configurations. Uh, let us now try and define cloud computing. We have talked about cloud computing. And um, the National Institute of Standards and Technology NIST, defines cloud computing as a model for enabling ambiguous, uh, convenient on-demand network access to a shared pool of configurable computing resources like networks, servers, storage applications, and services that can be rapidly provisioned and released with minimal management effort or service provider interaction. <laughs> Not that it is offered as a service delivery model, 
and cloud computing gives users convenient access to IT resources, right? To IT resources or uh, you know services uh, like uh, the network, servers, storage, applications, and you know uh, services. And the uh, prerequisite of on-demand as uh, access, we said we need to have a network. Um, uh, we need to have a network connectivity for us to be able to access, you know, those services and also to have on-demand access, right? And rapid source provisioning and reclamation fall into rapid elasticity characteristic of cloud computing. So the term cloud computing, like you hear the term cloud computing, I think that's on the next slide. Is that just a metaphor? Uh, the word cloud in this cloud computing is a metaphor for the internet, usually cloud, eh? when you hear the cloud, pe people usually refer to it as the internet. Whereas computing, uh, I think most of us know what computing is. And basically it refers to the computing services provided by a sufficiently powerful computer that is capable of providing range of functionalities, resources and storage. So put together cloud computing, uh, cloud and cloud and computing can be understood as a delivery of on-demand measured computing services over the internet. Uh, just this is what I think I've been explaining that it is an abstraction of the internet and infrastructure that underpins it. Whereas computing refers to the computing services, services provided by a sufficiently powerful computer capable of providing a range of functionalities resources and storage. Put together, cloud computing can be understood as a delivery of on-demand measurable uh, computing services over the internet. So let us look at the origin and uh, development of cloud computing. We already said by definition, cloud computing can be understood as a delivery of on-demand, of on-demand measured uh computing services over the internet right so the history of computing uh consists of both of the internet and computing models and we are going to discuss some of these things in the coming slide so let us look at the brief history of the internet you see in the beginning all computers were separated from each other and data computation and transmissions were done locally. Some big room, computer, someone walks in and gets into the computer, you can imagine. But later, the internet was born, uh, connecting all these computers and also the world together. And it was beautiful. We are able to communicate here in Zambia, Kenya, Nairobi, I don't know, name it. And we are able, we are all able to communicate. So in 19, we want to look at the brief history of, of, of the internet and how it came to be. And do not try to cram the years. We're not here to cram the years. Eh? We are cloud computing engineers. So we should just focus on other things, not trying to you know, cram the years. In my previous classes, I've got some students who have been singing the years, eh? say 1969, 1981. These things are not very relevant as far as cramming the years is concerned. Eh? But we just want to talk about it uh, maybe just focus on the things that I'll pay a lot of attention to. Now like Appanet, sorry. Now like Appanet, the birth of uh, Appanet was born. Uh, in 1969, uh, the Advanced Research Projects Agency Network, the Appanet was born. And it is widely recognized as the predecessor of today's internet. You all agree. Like many technologies that are underpinning our modern society, ARPANET was originally developed to serve military purposes. By the way, most of the technologies today, the backbone technologies we are relying on today, uh, usually most of them were developed by the military agencies. So it is said that ARPANET was launched by the US military to keep a fault tolerant communication network active in the US in, the, in case there was, uh, you know, some event of a nuclear attack to make sure that they have some kind of, you know, fault tolerant in case one, you know, site goes off, they can still access their launches and codes and, you know, do whatever they, they, they had to do. So there were four universities uh, that were connected to the ARPANET. Uh, that is the United States of the, in the United, Central United States, there was the University of, uh, California, Los Angeles, uh, Stan Stanford Research Institute, University of uh, California, Santa Barbara, and the University of Atta. So the birth of 
I've opened it here, marked the beginning of the internet era. So pay attention to that. Both of upon it. Two, also pay attention to the complete specification of the TCP IP protocol suit. I know the network engineers in here, when I mention TCP IP, uh, they understand very well and they are happy and they are smiling. But uh, the complete specification of TCP IP protocol suit were released for the first time, signaling the birth of the internet communication language. Uh, why the TCP IP protocol was needed. It is a suit of many protocols, right? And including uh, the TCP protocols, IP protocols, and other protocols. We are, most of us, actually all of us who are connected to this call, we are using the internet protocol. And also we are using the TCP protocol, right? And we are able to communicate, our devices are able to communicate, send packets from my PC to your PC and back and forth through using this protocol suit. Firstly, they developed the OSI model, uh, which had seven layers. And lastly, they you know, came up with a better uh, you know, TCP IP protocol, which has some people define them as five or others define them as four. We shall look at them. I don't know if we shall look at them in this chapter, but God willing, if there's something that is covering about the protocol suits, we shall get an opportunity to look at them. But this a uh, protocol and, and a suit it is just basically a suit, like you hear a suit, like a combination of quite a number of, uh, you know, protocols put together to define how our networks are going to communicate. So in 1981, there's a complete specification of the protocol suit. Okay. Uh, in 1983, all the three, you know, origin networks, the upper net, planet, stacknet here, uh, they were, you know, switched to the uh, switched to the TCP IP, which marked the beginning of an accelerated growth of the internet. And now pay attention also to this, right? The things I've, say, I've circled. And then the DNS technology was introduced in 1984. Imagine before they introduced the DNS, uh, what we are calling the domain name system, For you to be able to access a given browser, you would go in and punch in the IP address for Google, let's say 201.111.205.1. And you go ahead and you, you know, whenever you want to access google.com, you go and punch in that. So as many, you know, computers got onto the internet and many people getting different web addresses, Remember, it would be extremely hard for you to cram. Whenever you want to visit Huawei, you go to two, let's say 09.002.001.1. Cramming these numbers would not make a lot of sense to the human being. So that's why they decided to come up with a domain name system, uh, which, uh, which was invented in 1984. Since the adoption of TCP IP, the development of the internet, uh, picked up speed and more computers were added to the network and each computer used the TCP IP complaint numeric IP address to identify each other. Even your computers right now, you know, they have uh, an IP address, I'm sure a private IP address, which is translated because you're accessing the internet, which is translated to your public IP address being assigned to you by your, you know, service, internet service provider and you're accessing the internet, right? So it was hard for people to, you know, keep track of, of those IP address. So the DNS came in to translate between numeric IP addresses and more readily memorized domain names. I want to go to google.com, I'll just punch in google.com. What happens? These details will be sent to the domain name server and it will do the conversion and then the computers will, add, will be able to communicate to each other. Minus you having to cram and remember the IP address to the server of google.com. So in this way, computer users can locate their peers simply through domain names, leaving the translation work to the domain name servers. And also uh, in 1991, in 1991, of course, the other things here, I don't want to focus a lot of time. Uh, in 1986, modern email routing systems, MERS was developed. In 1989, the first commercial network operator, PeaceNet, was founded. And then in uh, 1990, the first 
search engine. Many of you think Google was the first search engine, but the first search engine actually was launched in 1990. And in 1991, in 1991, WW was officially open to the public. The World Wide Web, or simply the web, uh, has been here for almost over 40 years. It was uh, you know, launched to the public in 1991. And in 1995, we want to focus on uh, e-commerce platforms uh, such as Amazon and eBay were created. So I'm going to talk more about Amazon and you'll understand why I'm interested in Amazon. Uh, e-commerce platforms, uh, Amazon and eBay were founded in 1995. And many great companies such as Yahoo, Google emerged since the brief history of the internet began. Here, uh, we want to focus on Amazon since it is the first internet company that made commercial computing a reality. During these days, what used to happen? Remember, you know, you all know what Amazon does, right? It's an e-commerce company, and you know they used to run their online shops in the U.S. So what is usually used to happen in the early days, Amazon mainly sold books online and to process and store commodity and user information, Amazon had to build huge data centers, right? And the US, you know, usually has a festival that they call Black Friday. So during Black Friday, on that day, usually so many users are buying and they really needed to have a huge data center to be able to take care of such uh, you know, huge traffic on their platforms. So Amazon needed to process huge amounts of information and uh, all the information, all the servers in the data centers were used. But after the peak days, after the festive seasons and on other days, you know, normal days when the surge is low, most of the servers were idle and they were not doing anything. So to improve on return on investment, those guys were very clever. That guy was like, you know what? Amazon needs to, you know, lease out some of these idle servers so that uh, when we need them again, we can call them back. But when you're not using them, we should be able to give some of them to uh, lease them to some of the other, you know, you know, companies so that we'd be making money out of them in the meantime, instead of just maintaining them and we're not earning from them. So this was the reason why in 2006, Amazon launched the first clouding product, which they called the Elastic Compute as cloud, the ECS. So um, that is in 1995. In 2000, there was a data com bubble and you know, it went after busting so many companies, uh, you know, uh, faster, you know, what some of the IT companies were de declared bankrupt because people at this time were mostly investing into IT, but around 2000, uh, things were not going on well and some of them went bankrupt. But after 2000, things started picking up steadily. And in 2004, Facebook was launched and uh, it came with a phenomenal social networking until today they are making millions and millions of money. And in 2014, uh, the browser alliance led Google reinforced support of HTTPS, which are calling the hypertext transfer protocol using a secure socket or layer. So, I just want to just summarize what I've talked about and things you should be paying attention to. 1969, Appanet was born. After Appanet was born, 1981, uh, TCP specifications, a protocol suit were established. And after that, I also want you to pay to the domain name technology, right? We come from there, we go there, we go to the name, domain name technology, and also we come here in 1991, where WW was officially open to the public. Before it was used by the military and government agencies. By 1991, the internet was then now open to the public. So let us look at the, let us look at the brief history of computing. And uh, just a moment. A brief history of computing. We want to look at the brief history of computing. We have looked at the brief history of the internet. Now I want to look at the brief history of computing. Uh, traditionally, uh, the first, uh, the way instructions were being processed on a computer, they used the serial kind of processing, right? And uh, in serial, you know, computing uh, software 
was written uh, for serial computation. And each problem is broken down into a series. Uh, this guy you see here, the problem and it's broken down into a series of discrete series of instructions. And instructions were executed one after another on a single CPU. And only one instruction may execute at one time. So this made the process a bit, the problem, you know, complex problems take a long time and consume a lot of, you know, other resources. Because we have a, a task here, which has to be executed, it had to be broken down into a series of discrete instructions and instructions were processed one by one, you know, as they get to the CPU, processed one by one in a sequential order by the CPU and only one CPU. So these guys were like, you know what, we need to evolve and come up with parallel kind of computing. With parallel computing, in its simplest sense, parallel computing is a simulation use of multiple compute resources to solve a problem, right? Like parallel. Instead of having one guy, CPU, breaking down the serial you know, instructions, let us have one CPU, let us have the second CPU, the third CPU, and the fourth CPU to help us break down this one problem into different parts. And these different parts are going to parallel in a sequential way be broken down, right? So instead of having to wait, this part one, part two, they will all be processed at the same time, thus making computing faster. So each problem here, it is broken down into a series, uh, discrete parts that can be solved concurrently. And each part is further broken down into a series of instructions, just like serial computing and instructions from each part execute simultaneously on, on different CPUs. But at the end of it all, you need some kind of uni unified mechanism to make sure that the entire process is controlled. So traditionally, uh, prior computing has been uh, considered to be the high end of computing. Most, many of our computers today, the different cores that we are having on our computers are using parallel uh, computing technology. And um, it has been used for cases such as uh, scientific computing and numeric simulations of complex systems. But today, like you are aware, commercial applications are providing an equal greater dividing force in the development of faster computers. You need to have more powerful computers because there's a lot of data that is generated every day by internet of things, devices, by you know that devices that are connected to the network, by people processing devices every day. And that's why you also need some kind of more other ways of you know processing different tasks. So we want also to look at uh, distributed computing and like you hear the word distributed, you just have different computers distributed on a grid all on, uh, on, on the network. So distributed computing is a field of computer science that studies distributed systems. You have your systems and they're distributed and a distributed system distributes its different components to a different networked computer, which can communicate and coordinate their actions using, using a unified mechanism. And the components work together in order to achieve a common goal. So this is, you have your computer here, it's going to distribute the different resources. You have your job divided into sub job one, sub job two, sub job three, and these ones are you know, sent to the differently distributed computers for processing. We also have grid computing, and grid computing is the uh, use of widely uh, distributed computing or computers, right? So here, what happens? This grid computing is using this grid of widely distributed computers to process and do its you know, computations. And uh, uh, it's using these resources to reach a common goal and it's a special type of distributed computing. Whereas lastly, uh, cloud computing, which we are even focusing on this chapter, it is a new way of sharing infrastructure and it pulls massive amount of resources together to support a large variety of IT services. Moving forward, uh, this is the computing, uh, cloud computing evolution. We have era 0 0.1, era 0 0.2, and cloud computing era 0 0.3. Uh, this cloud computing era uh, 1.0, uh, this phase deals with virtualization of IT infrastructure. Yeah, computing virtualization of IT infrastructure. And we're going to look at them in detail and try to understand what is virtualization in the coming few chapters. 
And this also course basically focuses more on cloud computing 1.0 because as IT, uh, sorry, as cloud computing engineer, you cannot, you know, uh, go minus understanding the entire concept of virtualization. So enterprise IT applications are commonly decoupled from the underlying infrastructure. They are unaware or they are separate from the underlying structure and with the virtualization and cluster scheduling software, multiple enterprise IT application instances and runtime environments can share the same infrastructure leading to high resource, organized, resource utilization and efficiency. HCIA cloud computing covers mainly the implementation and advantages of cloud computing in this phase. Whereas in cloud computing too, basically it looks at resources that are you know, provisioned to cloud tenants and users as a standardized service and management in automation. Those who choose to do HCIP, the professional level, we shall look at uh, era 2.0 and era 3.0. But in cloud computing era point one, uh, we shall look at some of the different you know, service providers for virtualization tools, uh, Hyper-V uh, for Microsoft, uh, and uh, we shall look at Zen and KVM and VMware EX, and we shall look at virtualization and trying to understand how it's going to help us to fully utilize our resources. Okay, so we want to look at the cloud computing models, and we want to say that although not universally agreed upon, cloud computing is commonly categorized basing on cloud deployment and service models. Two. Cloud deployment, how is the cloud deployed? And also what services are the end users using? These are the two categories that we're going to look at. So let us look at cloud deployment, the first category. With cloud deployment, we have three things and we shall be looking at the fourth one, which we shall call the community. But um, we have three things. We have the public cloud, private cloud and hybrid cloud. What comes to your mind when you hear the word public? Something that is open for everyone to use. So public cloud is the earliest and best known form of cloud computing. And uh, public clouds are usually built and run by uh, cloud service providers and end users only access cloud resources or services on a subscription basis while the service provider will take care of all the operations and maintenance costs and administration responsibility. The, the, the cloud, um, the cloud uh, service provider will take care of the you know, servers, data centers, are they, uh, you know, are they cold well enough? Are we paying the ISP? Are we you know, having connectivity to these servers? Do we need to upgrade and patch this? Do we need to do that? They take care of all the underlying operations and maintenance plus administrative responsibilities. When it comes to the private cloud, like you hear the word private and they are usually de deployed for internal use, right? Within an enterprise or an organization, all other types of organizations. So here, all the data of a private cloud is stored in an organization's own data center. You have your data center in your organization that is running your cloud, right? Your employees are accessing your data center to access your files. You are the one who is paying for the software they're using, the hardware you go, buy the servers, install them, and then you are able to, you know, to maintain them. You make sure they are well connected. You make sure your physical servers, you know, are having, uh, they are well maintained. You cater for the power bills. You cater for everything else that involves as far as a data center is concerned. So this is the private cloud. Whereas hybrid cloud, like you hear the word hybrid, it is basically, as you can see this line here, a combination of the two. Um, hybrid cloud is a flexible cloud deployment mode and it may comprise of two or more different types of clouds. We have the public, we have the private community, which we will talk about later. And the main distinctive entities here we have two uh, combination of both the public and the private cloud, right? To come up with our hybrid cloud. It's basically combining those two. So the enterprise in some cases may choose, may choose you know, to, 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 to keep their core data assets 
on the premises in the private cloud, right? They may choose like our sensitive data, let's, let us store them on our um, private cloud. And, uh, and let us now choose to store some of the other data on private clouds for cost efficiency. Hence, you decide to come up with the hybrid cloud model. So to wind it up, a hybrid cloud allows users to enjoy the benefits of both public and private clouds. All right. So uh, there's also another uh, by deployment still we are looking at, and this is what you are calling community, community, community cloud. And a community cloud is a platform where the infrastructure is built and managed by a leading organization, right? You have your organization, so it builds, you know, some kind of cloud for other people within the same industry to access the, the organization. So, and it is shared over within the same organizations of that community. These organizations typically have common concerns, such as let's say security agencies, you know, they can be able to know who committed a crime, where they, they have their cloud, where they are able to share that data, you know, maybe for privacy performance and also compliance requirements. So the level of resource sharing may vary and the services may also be available with or without even a few. So, Community cloud is not a new concept and its difference from public and private clouds lies within the industry attribute. Like let's say you have your healthcare and or maybe your health patients, if you go to this hospital, as long as they have subscribed to that, you know, cloud, they're able to know the patient records and they best give you the care that you need. Also, maybe when you go to another, <clears throat> you know, hospital within the same industry, they can be able to assist you accordingly. So we have like transportation cloud, you know, where all the planes or dock, you know, docking uh, mechanism are synchronized in the cloud. They're able to know that, you know, the plane of Emirates has left Entebbe and it will be landing in Chicago within this time to that time. And they are sharing that information on or in real time. And then a financial cloud, and then also healthcare cloud. Let us look now by service models and we're going to look at service models. So in cloud computing, all deployed applications use some kind of hierarchical architecture. And typically there's a user facing interface where the end users create and manage their own data. And the underlying hardware resources and the operating system uh, on top of the hardware resources and the middleware and application runtime environment on top of the operating system. So we can call everything related to application and software layer and the underlying virtualization hardware resources such as network, computer and storage and infrastructure uh, to be part of the platform layer. So just to show you traditionally, you even on our computers that we have, we have different layers. We have our infrastructure layer and our infrastructure layer has everything right from the, you know, these different resources to the virtualization, you know, layer. Uh, our compute resources, the CPU, memory, start, blah, 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 storage resources, network resources, or our hardware is what we are calling the infrastructure layer. Now we have our platform layer and our platform layer goes all the way from, goes all the way from the, you know, the infrastructure, the hardware, all the way to the runtime environment, you know, where you install the drivers, libraries, the network framework, etc, etc. This is what we're calling the platform layer. And the software layer goes all the way uh, to the data that is stored on the computer to the applications that are using that data. So this is how we break down the different layers. We have three layers, infrastructure, platform and software layer traditionally. So if I have my machine and I've not installed uh, any operating system, it is just there. That is, uh, that is my infrastructure, right? The infrastructure I'm going to use. If I go ahead and I install the operating system, it asks me for the libraries, the drivers, I go ahead and install them. And also the runtime environment for my application, I go ahead and install the platform, which I'm going to use to run my different uh, softwares. And if I go ahead and also install the softwares and also put there the user data or the data the application will be using, then that is a software platform. 
So those are the three layers. So traditionally, if you want to have your own data center, you are going to have to take care of all the layers, right? You're going to take care of the infrastructure as a service. You're going to go ahead, walk into a shop, buy a physical server with a compute resources. You're going to buy storage capacity, you know, either devices, the NAS or SUN, depending on what you want. And then you're going to go ahead and also buy the network resources, buy switches, routers, cables, uh, you know, public IPs, configure them and all that. You're going to maintain them. You're also going to go ahead and buy a license for the operating system and install, uh, you know, install the operating system on your server. If it is open source, well and good, just go ahead, download, install. After that, configure the middleware that is going to enable your, you know, hardware to communicate with the different, you know, applications or, you know, different things attached on your computer. And also go ahead and install the runtime environment that you need, like, uh, you know, the network frameworks, the frameworks, the, uh, the different APIs, if you need some, and then you go ahead and put there the data, the application data, and then you go ahead and also install the application. So everything traditionally, you are going to take care of all those nitty nitty gritties as, uh, uh, as an engineer. But uh, when you choose to now go to cloud computing and you want to choose some of the services, you can either choose to have infrastructure as a service, you can choose to have platform as a service, and you can choose to have software as a service. I talked of infrastructure and I said that if it's the infrastructure, our service provider is going to take care of all the infrastructure layer. Remember here we are illustrated where the layers to. So our service provider is going to take care of all these things and for me, I'll just go into the cloud, go to Huawei Cloud or AWS or, or, or GCP platform, my console, and you know, get an Elastic Cloud server. Yes, I get my Elastic Cloud server and they give it to me empty. I go ahead, get my operating system. Now everything from this level to that level will be taken care of by me. So I'll go ahead and install my operating system of my choice, install the middleware, install the runtime environment, the data and the applications, everything, I will have to do it at that level on my own. This is what we are calling infrastructure as a service. So here, I am literally not concerned with whether uh, they are going to pay for, you know, how much power they are going to consume on the servers. I'm not even going to be concerned with, you know, maintaining those servers, uh, changing, uh, whatever it has to be changed. Me, I'm concerned with getting the measured services I requested for, as long as I have my four virtual CPUs running, as long as I have my memory allocated to me, I am not concerned with the operations and maintenance administration fees that are concerned with this server. All I need is me to just go and you know access my Elastic Cloud server and go ahead and install my softwares. This is what we are calling infrastructure as a service. When it comes to platform as a service, platform as a service, everything from the network resources, all the way from the infrastructure, all the way to the platform layer, all the way to the runtime is what we are calling platform as a service. Platform, right? Platform as a service. is what you're calling platform as a service. And with platform as a service, everything to the runtime environment is going to be taken care of by the IS, by the cloud service provider. The cloud service provider is going to make sure the operating system is installed. So I'll just go and I have my virtual machine in the cloud, go and choose what kind of virtual machine I need. And maybe I need the one for Windows, just go within two seconds, I provision it and it is up and running and ready to roll out. So they have installed the operating system for me. They have installed the everything. All I need, usually most of the times, these are kind of platforms are used by, uh, by um, are used by 
by developers usually they don't want to waste a lot of time you know configuring runtime environments and containers you know everything is up and running all you just need to do put your data and applications and you're good to go so everything else to that level is managed by the cloud service provider and now lastly the software as a service as you can see all the operations uh, operations and maintenance administrative you know responsibilities are taken care of by the service provider even the application itself i want to use facial recognition i'll just upload the picture and then say search and then it will search for me and then it will recognize the pictures go to my google photos app open it uh, search i want to search for my pictures and it will go through all the pictures and collect all the pictures for me and everything is being taken care of by the service provider so this means that all the three layers are managed by the service provider i said before when it comes to the infrastructure the service it refers to the situation where a cloud service provider provides and manages the infrastructure layer while the consumer looks at the two layers when it comes to platform as a service, I said it refers to a situation where cloud service providers manages the infrastructure and the platform layers while the consumer focuses on the application layer. I'll give you an example. If we go and buy a cloud server of the same specification from a public you know, cloud provider, and use an image to install our operating system and download and install the game. I'll give you an example. If you wanted to install a game, right? You have your FIFA 21 and you want to play the game. So in this case, if you go and buy a cloud server and it is empty and you need to go on that cloud server before you play the game, you actually go ahead and install the operating system after installing the operating system you download and install fifa this game and when using the when after installing the game and everything that it is required this is what we are calling infrastructure as a service right infrastructure as a service like you have started operating on your server from the operating system level. But in some cases, if we buy a, a cloud server and uh, we are not ready to go, sometimes we may get a, you know, a runtime environment with a network framework error, right? And we install it and we're trying to install it and it's asking us for, you know, that dot framework error, that the network frameworks, meaning we have to install everything all the way to the application layer. But if we get the server, and all we need is to just download the game and install it. We have not installed any operating system. We have not installed any network, network framework. All we need to do, copy the game to our classic, download the game to our server, install it and play it. This is what we are, we are calling platform as a service. If in any chance we actually get by our server and we don't have to download and install the game, all we need to do open the server and boom, they're asking us for our username and password. Then and after we punch in the username and password, the game launches. This is what we are calling platform. Sorry, this is what you're calling software as a service. Like already the software is installed and put their app in the cloud. All we need to do is open, put in the you know, password and username, and then we are able to use the game. That is what we're calling software as a service. If you want to use some things like, let's say, Office 365, you just go online, open your browser, go to Word, edit your documents. You have not installed Word on your computer. You have not installed Excel on your computer, but that software is installed somewhere on someone's server, but you're accessing it as a software, as a service. I hope that makes a lot of sense. And now, uh, this brings us to our quiz here. And we are saying, which of the following services offered by Huawei Cloud, public clouds falls into software as a service?
Someone to say mic check or you want maybe, me to launch? Or you want maybe, me to launch? Yeah. Okay, let me launch. Facial the poll. recognition. Let me launch. Facial the poll. recognition. Let me launch the poll. Let me launch the poll. You can check on your screen and you can answer accordingly. You have about 30 seconds to submit your answers. Uh, Mike, check. There's nothing appearing on my screen. Kindly check again. You should be able to see it. Just check and see. You check, cross check with your Zoom. You should be able to see it. About 125 participants have responded. About 130 participants have responded. About uh, 140 participants have responded. About 150 participants have responded and I'll be ending the poll at exactly one minute past. And the minute has passed, so I'll end the poll from here and display your results. This is what you have selected and many of the people selected facial recognition. And yes, the answer is, facial recognition. Because when it comes to uh, the Elastic Cloud Server, here you're just having you know, a server on the cloud. You have to go ahead, uh, install the operating system on it, install the runtime environment on it, and the, the, the midware, go ahead and put there your data and application, then you are able to use your applications. With facial recognition, you can even just open a browser and go to Google Photos, and you know, you can search the pictures and then it is able to return, like you have not installed any of the operating system, you have even not installed the software on your local machine, right? Sorry, on the cloud server, you have just found everything working and this makes it the software which we are accessing over the internet. So that's why we have software as a service uh, 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 tool. Now uh, we'll see, this is Elastic Cloud Volume, basically you're looking at storage, They've given it to you, still infrastructure as a service, still OBS, we're still having infrastructure as a service. Okay, so let us look at uh, poll two. I'm going to be sharing the poll. I'm going to be sharing the poll. Okay, it should be on your screen now. It is saying that the measured Service characteristics of computer clouding, computer cloud computing means that users pay for how long and how much they use the cloud service. Is that true or is it false? True. Okay. Uh, it, it, it would be false. Uh, it's false. I'll end the poll at exactly a minute past. You still have about 30 seconds. The answer is false. The answer is false. It's true. That's not true. That's not true. It's false. The answer is true. Okay, so I'll end the poll. And as you can see, many of you have selected true. But I want us also to draw our attention to this question once again, right? We are saying that the measurable service characteristics of cloud computing means that users pay for how long and how much they use the cloud service. But I remember somewhere I emphasized, I said, metering, yes, it is true. We are getting to know how long and, and uh, how long have I been and how many resources I'm using on a service. But I said measurable does not necessarily mean that they are charging me. You know, there are free services in the cloud. 
the free tire. And I remember saying that metering is not necessarily billing, isn't it? So when someone says that this characteristic means that you, are, you pay, it means that you are billed for how long and how much you use the cloud service. So that means this entire statement is false. I don't know if you are now getting the clear picture. So you also, when you're answering, you need to pay a lot of detail, attention to detail, right? Because the statement in itself, when you just look at it, it all appears and seems to be true, isn't it? But when you actually go to this statement, which I made about uh, measured service, and I said measured service is not necessarily not bidding. Just like you use water at home, every day you build, every time you use water, right? You have, sorry, every time you use water, it is measured. They know you have, you have used it, you have used two liters that day, isn't it? But they have not billed you there and then. It is only at a particular time that they will come and bill you. Same with electricity, you use your units and they will keep decreasing. They are metering, they know you are putting on your TV, it is consuming these units, you are putting on that, it's consuming that units. But they will use that information to bill you. But them measuring the service does not necessarily mean that actually that is bidding, okay? Though when they're bidding, they will depend on the measuring capability to bill you, depending on how much and how long you have used the cloud services. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yes, it is. It makes a lot of sense. Okay, so- Yes, yeah, it does. All right. Yes. All right, so we have looked at uh, uh, what cloud computing is. Uh, we have been able to describe the brief history of cloud computing, list a few use cases of cloud computing, and describe so, characteristics. So you mean the second question answer is uh, false, right? Yes, 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 the answer is false. Okay. All right, then uh, lastly, uh, recommendations, uh, you can go ahead and look at those resources. And thank you for being part of today's lecture. And we shall meet again tomorrow. Same